Hello, everyone. Um, I am Adia Lamro, the Digital Content Specialist at the Wiseman Art Museum. And this is uh, Ricky Williams, who is the Public Engagement and Learning Coordinator at WAM. Um, and I'd just like to begin by acknowledging that the Wiseman Art Museum at the University of, Twins of Minnesota Twin Cities is um, located within the traditional homelands of the Dakota people. It is important to acknowledge the people on whose land we live, learn, and work as we seek to improve and strengthen our relations with our tribal nations. This land acknowledgement is just a first step in the long, complex process of reconciling with the colonial legacy of our institution. With this acknowledgement and our ongoing work with the repatriation of the numerous cultural materials and truth and repair project, we affirm our commitment to this process. Tonight, we will hear from three artists whose work is featured in the other four, Liza Silvestri, uh, Rotem Tamir, and Christopher Robert Jones. We will also hear from Dr. Um, Jessica Cooley, who is our moderator, um, and she will guide our conversation tonight about the ways that the other four promotes intimacy between audience and artwork through touch, breath, and close listening. The other four assembles a varied display of 16 multimedia works by 21 contemporary artists that forefront the senses of smell, taste, touch, and sound. Exploring the richness of the human experience, the exhibition engages audience primarily through the non-visual, the other four senses. These works center our attention on these four often upstage senses through disparate means, including technology, performance, interaction, and experimental practice. In so doing, the arts work, the arts works um, point to the vast realm of physical and emotional experience that vision alone cannot access or promote. Curated by Twin Cities-based artist and independent curator John Sherman, the other four capture, captures the spirit of regionally based avant-garde artists who experiment with, a, with and produce sensory art. The other four is currently on view at the Wiseman Art Museum and will be on display until May 19th, 2024. Uh, before we begin, I would like to thank Kevin, Rosemary, and Hannah Rose McNeil with the KHR McNeil Family Fund for their generous general operating support for the Wiseman Art Museum, along with our annual fund donors who make this work possible. I'm grateful to my colleagues at the Wiseman for helping to make this event happen this evening. As we begin our conversation, we invite you to submit your questions and thoughts through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will respond to you, your question in the Q&A period after the conversation. We will be recording tonight's event, and in the coming days, this conversation will be posted to the Wiseman's YouTube channel. And we also have live transcription for tonight's conversation available, but you need to turn it on to see this. I am pleased to introduce you to our panelists tonight. Liza Silvestri is a transdisciplinary artist and a research assistant professor within the College of Fine and Applied Arts at UIUC, where she has co-founded the initiative CRIP, CRIP Cripismology and the Arts, uh, CRIP asterisk as uh, uh, short for short. Silvestri has been the recipient of both an artist's initiative and an arts learning grant for the Minnesota State Arts Board, a fellowship through art, art uh, sorry, art, Artists on the Verge, and most recently she has been named a 2021 Joan Mitchell Foundation Fellow and a 2022 Louis Comfort Tiffany Fellow. She has been artist in res residence of the Weissman Art Museum and the Center for Applied and Translational Sensory Science, CATS for short. In 2019, she received a Citizens Advocate Award from the Minnesota Commission of the Deaf, Deaf, Blind, and Hard of Hearing, MNCDHH. Silvestri's work has been written about in Art in America, Moose Magazine, Ocula Magazine, Art Monthly, SciArt Magazine, and others. Christopher Robert Jones is an artist, writer, and research assistant professor at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. They are a co-founder of CRIP, CRIP uh, asterisk, CRIP Epistemology and Arts, um, CRIP uh, asterisk for short, um, a transdisciplinary initiative that is housed within the College of Fine, Art, Fine and Applied Arts. 
Their recent blue description project made in collaboration with Liza Silvestri and uh, Sarah Hayden will be screening this spring and summer at the Gene Sisko Film Center, uh, MIT List Visual Arts Center, Whitney Museum of American Art, Personal Space Gallery, Weatherspoon Art Museum, and BFI South Bank Center. Ratem Tamir is an artist from Israel who migrated to the United States in 2011. Currently, she serves as assistant professor in sculpture at the Department of Art at the University of Minnesota. Her work has been exhibited at venues including Locust Projects, Miami, Florida, the Harn Museum, Gainesville, Florida, CAV uh, 16 Community Gallery for Contemporary Art, Tel Aviv, BCA Center, Burlington, Vermont, Artist House, Tel Aviv, among others. Tamir has been awarded residencies at Sculpture Space, Utica, New York, Seven Below Arts Initiative in Burlington, Vermont, Art Omi International Art Center, among, and among others. She received the Toby Devon Lewis Fellowship Award, the Artist Exhibition Grant from artistcontemporary.org, um, based in New York, and she is a 2021 McKnight Fellow. Um, and then a little bit about our moderator, Jessica Cooley. Jessica Coo uh, A. Cooley is a scholar curator working at the intersection of curatorial and museum studies, disability studies and crip theory, and modern and contemporary art. Cooley holds a PhD in art history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Her first book project centers on what she calls crip materiality, and will forward a new methodology to address how ableism affects the understanding and valuation of the very fibers of art materials within curatorial and conservation discourses. Cooley was a guest curator for the Ford Foundation Art Gallery in New York City from 2020 to 2022, where she co-curated a multi-year online and physical exhibition titled Indisposable. From 2006 to 2007, sorry, 2010, she was the assistant curator at Davidson College's Van uh, Avery slash Smith Galleries, where she curated numerous exhibitions, including re slash formations, disability, women, and sculpture. Currently, Cooley is the ACLS uh, Emerging Voices Fellow at the University of Minnesota's Liberal Arts Engagement Hub. And now uh, I would like to welcome the panelists to the screen. Hi, thank you so much for those introductions and thank you all for being here. I want to first thank the folks at the Weissman for making this conversation possible to our ASL interpreters and captioners to you, the audience, and thanks to Liza, Christopher, and Rotem for doing the hard work of thinking together with us tonight. And before I say anything more, I want to do an access check to make sure that folks have what they need to be present today. So for example, please let us know if you have trouble accessing the captions. Um, I think you can put that in the chat and um, our folks on the other end will will help you out. Um, I am Jessica Cooley. I use she, her pronouns. I am a 41-year-old lushly and fleshed white woman with brown hair. And I am coming to you from um, our office at home, which is filled with books and music equipment and multicolored lights. I am a scholar and curator that for the past 15 years has specialized in ways of thinking about our methodologies related to the complex intersections of disability art and curatorial practice. I am also a person who identifies with disability as a traumatic brain injury means that I process at a slower pace and sometimes have trouble finding words or remembering names or ideas. And embracing my slowness and aphasia is actually a key part of my work as a writer, curator, and scholar who seeks to dismantle oppressive ableist expectations around the correct ways to communicate. So to extrapolate on the work of disability scholar, Alison Kafer, 
rather than bend disabled body minds to meet the expectations of normative communication, CRIP communication bends those expectations to meet our disabled body minds. So I'd like to extend this flexibility and accessible openness to our conversation tonight. I also want to invite you into a disability-centered model of care for all our bodies and minds by extending an invitation to everyone to let go of expectations for how we attend and participate in online conversations like this one. I invite you to listen to your body mind. If you need to lie down or close your eyes, if you need to stretch or stem or knit or draw, I want to invite you to please do what brings you comfort. You will notice that we will be accompanying most images with visual descriptions as a form of access for people with visual impairments and as a way to offer time to contemplate the formal qualities and subject matter of the work itself. For multiple reasons, we will all try to speak at a slow pace. And um, we hope that this pace will also allow you to relax into our words and ideas and allow you time to process at your own speed. So tonight we have the pleasure of talking uh, with three remarkable artists featured in the other four exhibition, Liza Sylvester, Christopher Robert Jones, and Rotem Tamir. Thank you all for being here. Um, so to begin, I want to start by riffing on a question from disability arts organizer, Kevin Gotkin. Um, and so I'd like to ask you all, how's the body mind? A question that you can take in whatever way you'd like, including offering a visual description or just telling us how you're doing and feeling today. And I think it would make sense to maybe start with Christopher who is joining us asynchronously. And so that would be slide three. Oh, it looks like the volume is off. Um, Um, hi, y'all. I'm just oops, sorry. Can you hear it now? Speaking. I'm okay, a white awesome. person with short brown hair, uh, mustache, uh, glasses, over the ear, kind of black headphones, um, a uh, kind of light, off white, um, button up collared shirt. And uh, behind me is a virtual background, uh, which is a picture of. Um, some prairie Coreopsis flowers um, in our uh, prairie garden here in uh, central Illinois, um, where I am speaking to you from. Um, it is in actuality a kind of cold, uh, rainy, uh, sort of unpleasant <laughs> spring day. Um, so uh, I am enjoying um, the kind of sunny quality of of this virtual background to lift my spirits a little bit and think uh think towards um uh the kind of brighter spring days ahead um i'm also speaking to you from uh an asynchronicity that's more supportive to my communicating and my access needs um and i uh want to both thank um, Jessica and um, the event organizers for uh, facilitating that, but also I want to note that um, part of participating or being present in this way um, is important to kind of understanding presence or attendance or participation or collectivity um, outside of a kind of synchronous dominant mode um and uh i think that that is that's really integral to what an event or a conversation 
like this can or, or should mean and do. Um, so I'm really happy to be here with you and it's kind of everything to do with um, what uh, Jessica's talking about in terms of crypt communication or um, disabled body mind kind of participation. So um, I just want to kind of double underline that for myself and um, say hello from a slightly different uh, time and place to the one that y'all are sharing uh, presently. Um, and maybe to uh, segue that further into a uh, question of how is the body mind um, that it may be maybe more appropriate for for myself to um, point to a kind of interdependent status of of the body mind tonight as um, Liza will kind of extrapolate on and um, and take up um, a kind of shared answering space for the two of us Liza and I collaborate um, and work together in in varying capacities and um, and uh, and very much are invested in a kind of interdependent um, uh, type of collaboration. Um, so I think that a question about um, the kind of status of of my body mind, my my thinking goes towards uh, the ways in which that experience is uh, interdependent with and uh, intertwined with. Um, uh, my collaborator Liza, and whose presence and um, uh, participation in a certain capacity makes uh, my access possible um, in in others. So, um, yeah, thanks. Cool. I love that Christopher um, could Ed could join us in that way. I think it's a really cool. Um, way to have these conversations. And I, I hope models of, like this get replicated in the future. Um, so I don't know if, if Liza or Tim want to uh, talk about how's the body mind? I can go next and this would, okay. Um, yeah, so this is Liza Sylvester speaking, and I'm joining you all from uh, my home in Urbana, Illinois, um, just a bit of a distance from most of you who are in Minneapolis. Um, so I'm glad to be here virtually. Um, my body mind today, as Christopher mentioned, it is gray, rainy, sleety, cold. Um, I'm reminded that spring is one of those seasons that I both love and um, I feel like it's such a tease because it will warm up and then it plunges us back into winter and it's frustrating and tiring in its own way. Um, I am feeling grateful to be here. Thank you for the invitation to um, speak with you all tonight. I'm, I'm super excited to, to talk with you all. Um, I'm also feeling um, achy. <laughs> uh, we have a, a brand new baby and I'm feeling that mid back pain tonight. Um, and maybe a little bit slower than usual, but mostly just grateful to be here. Um, yeah. Um, and I can maybe close with a quick verbal description just saying that I'm a, a white woman, I'm 40. Um, I have thick rimmed glasses on today um, and like a denim top and I'm sitting on a kind of brown leather couch um, on the second floor of, of my house. Thank you. Yeah, Liza, I thought you should go uh, after Christopher because, uh, you know, you work together, you live together. So I thought it's, you know, um, Thank you. I'm I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, my name is Rotem Tamir, and I'm speaking to you from, uh, as Liza mentioned, from uh, Minneapolis, uh, from my studio. Um, 
I have a, a curly black hair. Um, uh, I I think like a beige skin kind of thing. And um, and I'm wearing a red shirt. Uh, in the background, you can probably see some tools uh, and some fabric, which, uh, and I think the main thing that you will see a lot is actually fluorescent, <laughs> which is uh, the studio. Um, body mind um, today. Uh, my son is uh, in a spring break and he's at home, but I'm walking, which is always kind of weird. Uh, there is all, always a lot of guilt involved in that. Um, something that I walked for, like that I spent many hours in the studio, didn't walk the way I want. <laughs> Maybe we will talk about it today somehow. But um, there is this kind of like, although I, although I on purpose do like a, I don't necessarily want things to go the way I want. I still in fight with that, right? Like I, I still want it to go, but anyway. So I'm I'm there too. And um and I am looking for that conversation. Um I really appreciate uh, my colleagues that are here today to talk about such a, an important topic and uh, I'm just grateful to be part of it. So thank you for that and thank you for the Wiseman for uh, facilitating this. That's great. Thank, thank you both so much. Um, and I will say we got a sneak peek of Liza's new baby earlier and it was very, very, very cute. Um, but we should continue on with the conversation at hand. And I think it would be helpful um, to talk about your works in this exhibition. And so I wonder if you could offer a visual description of your works, tell us about the pieces and how you think they fit into the other four exhibition. And I think the way that we have the slides set up, it makes sense for maybe Rotem if, if you could uh, speak to this first and then move to Liza and then to Christopher and Liza's pieces. That would be great. Sure. Are we going to see the image? Um, yeah, let's see if they can. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, when you look, when you uh, enter into the exhibition to the left, you will see um, narrow kind of like an um, average height of a human body uh, plywood um, thick plywood raw plywood it may look like a thin raw door that's waiting to be painted uh, to the right side of the of this plywood there is a tuba mouthpiece attached with a red straw and that's kind of like the only the only color uh, in in this piece. And for me, it's also the only indication that uh, you potentially can uh, I call it breathe, not blow, breathe into this uh, door, uh, this plywood. And when you blow into it, a very low tone is heard. Um, that low and um, low bass and very relative loud that resonant in the space. That's the description. That's great. Um, would you like to say anything else, or I can we can move on to to Liza. Um. No, not right now. No, thank okay. you. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's totally fine. All right. Yes, there we go. Yeah, so this is um well, first of all, it's really cool to hear about your work, Rotem. Thank you for I haven't actually been physically in this iteration of the exhibition, so I'm enjoying experiencing it this way and really love learning about your work as well. Um so this is uh, an image of um, taste and sense survey, which is somewhere in the exhibition. Um, 
And yeah, so Jessica just switched to, this is the smell survey. There's um, a pedestal here with um, two pads of paper and then two glass cylinders. One is filled with a dark substance that actually has um, mint leaves in it. And then there's pencil and a, um, like a slot. And um, both of these works are survey pieces where I'm asking people to both smell and in the other, this one that Jessica just switched the slide to is the taste survey. You can see in that glass cylinder, there's actually um, some mints um, that are in white plastic. Um, and this is, um, I would say, a piece where the, the artwork is really existing in the experiencer um, interacting with it, which is they're meant to um, take a mint into their mouth and name and describe the mint or smell the mint in the other case um, of the, the scent survey. Um, and try to describe the sensory experience without naming what they're describing, um, which is essentially impossible. And that's sort of the whole point of the piece is to um, be stumped on this big gap or rift between the sensory experience and then translating that into words, um, which is, has a lot to do with access and a lot to do with um, subjective experience as well. I can maybe stop there just for the sake of time. No, that, that's great, thank you. Um, and would you mind also speaking about the work you created with Christopher? That'd be great. Yeah, that, that's cool. Um, yeah, so on this slide here, you see this um, big monitor that's on the floor. And then there's three people that are standing above the monitor and they kind of have their heads um, crooked. And this is because the captions of the monitor go um, 360 degrees around the perimeter of the monitor. Um, so depending on your orientation, you do have to either follow them to read them or you know, kind of move your body with them in order to read them. Um, and then on the wall, you can see um, some text, um, which is there's four panels of, um, it's actually the same text that the, the captions show in the video, which you could show just maybe a short clip in a moment here, Jessica, um, that uh, is on the wall. So the, the access is sort of expanded across these two different mediums. Um, and those are hung, they're, you know, hand drawn on, um, tissue paper and tracing paper. Um, so there's this delicate quality to it that's sort of offset by the weight of that monitor. Um, and the, the actual text, like the physical text that was um, you know, copied to make that, that drawing that's in the corner um, was based on um, excerpts from, thank you, Jessica, um, John Cage, writings and lectures and different publications. So it's like very pieced together and you can kind of see the variation if you look closely. Um, and these, the text was taken from excerpts of John Cage's lectures. There was um, a number of them that Christopher found. We worked on this piece together. It's a collaborative effort. Um, and so the way that we did this is we put them we put the lectures into a podcast software called Descript, um, which is a weird software that's very cool. It's used for podcasts, but it essentially allows you to like edit the words and then that edits the sound. So as someone with a hearing loss, it's an interesting um, accessible software in that way where I don't need to just listen to the audio. I can listen also I can read and manipulate what is written and what is read, and that manipulates the sound rather than the other way around. Um, and so maybe 
for the sake of time here, you could just play like a short clip of the video, Jessica, and then I can stop there. In solitude, to be in solitude or is having been stretched out between a crowd. And is technology the straightness? A certain vessel, the body expanding, smoke in the art museum. And Jessica, we don't need to play the whole thing. You'll just have to go to the exhibition. But um, I'll just say that, you know, that, that clipping sound, that's John Cage's voice. And um, we were really interested in, you know, it was taken from three different lectures and then pieced together in this sort of like collaged, um, unpolished way, I will say. And, Felt that it was a nice way to um, think through technology through a weird lens, which is so similar to what um, maybe hearing with a cochlear implant is like. Where it's, um, I'm not, I'm hearing sound, but I'm hearing sound through something. Um, and I sort of have to, uh, I don't know, what things sound like is unstable for me, I guess, is a, a way of, of saying that. So I have to trust that I'm, I'm hearing certain things. Um, and so I thought that the, you know, taking these um, excerpted vocalizations of different things and then putting them together and making them say something new was a sort of unraveling of, of this particular experience that I have with sound. And I, I'm going to stop now just for the sake of time. I've been talking for a while, so. This is Jessica speaking. That No, that was great. And, and thank you so much. Um, and just for clarity, I think our colleague Medea is behind the scenes forwarding our, our um, slideshow. So I just wanted to also say thank you for doing that for us. Um, I think um, it might be nice to kind of transition now into a question that gets um, more to, I think, the heart of your works, but also the way um, your works um, kind of fall in line or, or come to play in the exhibition as a whole. Um, and so the question is, this exhibition is premised on rethinking our relationship with our senses by deprioritizing sight in favor of the other four senses. But I wonder what your perspective is on what one might argue is the impossibility of separating the senses as distinct from each other, and therefore the trouble with prioritizing or deprioritizing them. Could you talk about how your works highlight the complicated nature of sensory experiences and why that's important to you? And either Liza or Rotem. Liza, do you want me to start? Okay. Um, so in this specific work, in that particular work, I, so up until that moment uh, of making this work, and the first time I did that work was in 2016. Uh, when I work with sound, I, in the beginning, it was unconscious, and then it became conscious. Uh, I work with sound that I can, um, that I am, um, that I have really hard time to hear, which is uh, low tones, low pitches, um, and in this work, well, before this work, I, I started noticing that I have this feeling um, that that I always miss something. Like there is something in life that I'm missing with kind of like thoughts that um, that uh, if there are things in life that we can only experience through sound, which I cannot hear. So then what is the thing in life that I'm missing? And as, a, as an artist, I was wondering, 
can I catch it somehow? Can I catch it visually? So this, this, in this work, I was very interested that the most in, interesting visual element that exists in the piece, which is the internal maze that exists inside this kind of like plywood. Um, the only, the, 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 this visual element can, um, you can only know about it by the sound. So the sign defined, defined by this uh, maze, internal maze, but you cannot hear it. Uh, you cannot see it, yeah? So I was curious about this kind of like relation between uh, uh, listening, uh, hearing and uh, looking uh, and the absence of, of one of these factor. Maybe I would also say that um, uh, the, the, for me, it's also not only uh, the sound, it's also a vibration and it's also like a, a feeling in the body. It's a sensation thing. Uh, I, when someone blow into this piece, first of all, I call it, I like to call it the kiss and I'm thinking about breathing. Like I'm thinking about just this intimacy that like one person come close to this thing and you touching it and then you kissing it and you bring your air into this piece, right? And then it's a low tone it sounds. For me, there is a lot of intimacy in it. And, um, and then when the sound is heard and it's very kind of like, oh, like it's very, very, very deep. Um, there is a vibration in my in my the, in my perspective. There is a vibration that happening in the space, and it's activate the space. The sound activate the space and go back to your body. So you give something to the space, and it's bringing back to you. I'm thinking about this kind of like circle and relationship. Um. So maybe I would like maybe my answer. If you, you can understand from my answer that no, I don't think we can separate between the senses. Uh, I just think that maybe we are less aware to some information that we receive through different senses or we prioritize or deprioritize some senses. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. And I I really like the way that you're talking about the senses as and this kind of circular connective route and also the um, interaction with the piece itself, not as a blowing into, but as a breathing, which, you know, creates that, that intimacy in a, in a different level. Um, and so, yeah, Liza, I don't know if um, you'd like to talk about the senses. Yeah. Um... So cool. I wish I could experience that piece in person, Rotem. Um, it's really neat. Um, so I'll, I'll try and talk briefly about both works. Um, I mean, in in the um, the case of the the scent and piece for the, um, those are distinctly um, singular sensory experiences theoretically. Um, and the work, you know, arose because often, because I have a hearing loss, deafness, um, when people find out about it, or guess about it, um, sometimes or oftentimes, I get questions like, oh, well, what does music sound like to you? Um, or, you know, describe this thing. And it's an impossible thing to name I mean my experience is not made up of gaps it's just made up of my experience right um and I have my own full experience every moment of the day right um and so the works were sort of a way to turn that question on its head and and ask people to describe their own experiences um which is you know instead of me saying you you described the the music in this case 
um, which is the question I often get, or what does your your own voice sound like, which is another question. It's like that's an impossible question for any of us to to answer, um, or a really complicated one at least. And we can attempt, um, but it's never going to be correct. Um, so um, I, I like the idea of, of stumping people with this. And it also speaks to, and I mentioned this briefly already, but uh, the subjectivity of, of access, right? Which is sort of a, a hot topic in you know, the audio descriptive world where um, we're trying to understand if there's an objective way to describe things. And I would argue that there's not <laughs> because there's no such thing as an objective experience, just like there's no such thing as a, a normal experience. We're all having some variation of an experience. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I also love the idea that people have these sensory experiences and then they, they put them in this slot and they don't see them again. And that's because I get them <laughs> and I get to learn about, um, I get to learn about what they've experienced through them. I've never been in the exhibition. I'm not interacting with these people, but I get these very sort of like intimate descriptions of things or a variety of descriptions of things. Um, and then in the case of um, the untitled work that Christopher that I made, I would say that the, the sensory experience is really spread out across things and it is more multi-sensory, um, whether that's thinking about like the multi-sensory experience of like the orientation that most artworks ask us to take, which, um, you know, so many of the works in this exhibition are really challenging, uh, normative, uh, body embodied experiences that you typically experience when you're you're viewing art, um, right? Because we're not viewing art necessarily; we're we're engaging in art, um, and we are activating art in different ways. Um, and so, um, this sensory experience is is stretched out across. You know, the captains are repeated but in different mediums um, and so the experience of them is different across different materials. Um, the orientation makes you engage with it differently, it makes you occupy your body differently. Um, and then also it's taking up this sort of historical uh, enormous artistic figure because the voice is John Cage um, who is most famous for 433 which is a piece about silence um, or the absence of silence, which is a weird thing to think about, but I realized that I really think about John Cage in a similar vein to the way that I think about um, maybe Robert Irwin and John uh, James Terrell, like their, their early sensory experiences um, where they would go into anatomic chambers and experience what it's like to have no sound. And it was like this very like, in my opinion, white male, uh, able-bodied experience, right? I mean, it's beautiful. It's 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 all the things, right? It's historically relevant. Um, but as a person, you know, female presenting body who is disabled, I'm like, well, 433. I experience that every moment of the day, really. <laughs> um, so I didn't need to like, you know, have someone pointed out to me. Um, and I think that that is sort of like the nice disjunct between, you know, these these incredibly prolific historical artistic figures and like the disabled body um, and the disabled artists. It's, um, there's, there's like a, a, you think there's a large gap, but there's like a weird closeness um, in, in some of the things that we're, we're dealing with. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Yeah, that that's so great. I um, I just wanted to mention that I think we could probably spend an hour talking about any one of these questions, and so I kind of feel bad like moving on to the next. But I, you know, I, I think the questions and and what you all are talking about actually have a through line throughout, and so we'll kind of come back to some of these pieces as we talk about the next question. Um, which is a question about um, illegibility. And as you can see, I write questions in paragraph forms. So um, 
just bear with me while I read. Um, so in all your pieces, there is a provocative interplay between what is offered to the audience to know and experience, and also what is intentionally withheld from the audience. We could talk about this as a juxtaposition between legibility and illegibility. For example, Rotem's piece conceals the inner workings of the sound making elements of her work. The audience's written responses to Liza's taste and smell survey don't end up on display, but are deposited into an opaque pedestal where the content and the responses and their future remain unknown. And in Liza and Christopher's collaborative work, not only does it occupy the often overlooked corner of the gallery, but the words drawn on the tracing paper and their repetition on the floor monitor rely on the use of ellipses, that punctuation mark of three dots that signifies an omission of words or that represents a pause. So my question is what does this juxtaposition between a revelation of information and an intentional omission or withholding of information mean to you? Or in other words, does illegibility open up something else for you and your work that wouldn't have been possible had all the pieces been made available to the audience? Um, and I'm thinking that maybe we can start with um, an offering from Christopher first. Is that work for you all? And then, okay. So I think on the next slide, there should be a video from Christopher. For speaking. Um, I think this, the, these ideas of legibility and illegibility are, are interesting and support in conversation, especially related to um, a discussion of, of, uh, of sensory information in art or separating of the senses in, in artwork um, or what it means to kind of complicate that. Um, because they're, they're, you know, it may be important to make a, a distinction between um, an exploration of uh, sensory difference that takes the able body as a kind of defaultive position or um, operates with an idea of uh, a whole or complete that can be returned to um, if the artwork removes um, some piece of that puzzle, right, that we can ultimately return to it or that the value that experiencing that omission um, uh, might hold is in relationship to that reliable idea of a whole um, as something that is maybe in a kind of tension um, or opposition to um, a kind of crepistemological approach to what creative production might be or kind of meaningfully understanding or incorporating um, disabled perspectives into um, art making and, and art discourse. Um, uh, partially in, in, in this may be in relationship to how disability uh, in, in art more generally is often or almost exclusively um, treated as a deficit or a lack uh, in individual, located in individual bodies in need of kind of um, elevation or interpretation or uh, in, in need of being made legible or intelligible in order for it to hold value instead of understanding that perspective um, as something that, that is a, a radical contributor to knowledge. Um, so, um, you know, I, I personally, in, in, in my work, in our collaborative work, um, uh, emphasize a kind of epistemological approach um, to creative practice. Um, so that's one that doesn't situate or silo disability, you know, only in a place of, of a kind of subject matter where where a piece can be about disability but it, it's important to also have a kind of methodological component 
um, uh, where disability is functioning as as the kind of the the engine. Um, so a piece can be both about and and of disability at the same time. And I think that's maybe an important distinction or consideration to make um, in thinking about how uh, legibility or illegibility could be um, valuable in a conversation around um, uh, the senses. Um, and uh, another aspect of this, and it, it reminds me of a stanza from the artist uh, William Popel's text, Whole Theory, um, in which he writes uh, about uh, how basically a kind of imbrication or, or uh, a relationship between having um, and possessing and knowing um, and the kind of fantasy that that having or possessing um, has a, a, a inherent kind of relationship to to not knowing or knowledge. And maybe where that's connected to this idea of legibility or illegibility in regard to to disability um, is that uh, you know, taking some stock of how we understand um, uh, you know, knowledge beyond possession or or technique beyond mastery. Um, and that there isn't uh, an inherent kind of positive value to uh, legibility or intelligibility. Um, and that um, these are important kind of critical spaces that exist um, outside of a kind of, uh, you know, ableist framework that can be explored um, and, and understood and um, uh, and valued for their their contribution to knowledge um, or the creative field. And we don't need to um, return to that idea of a whole or that um, able body as a, as a kind of defaultive <clears throat> position. Um, and that, you know, comes into play, I think, often, um, especially, you know, in in, in Lies and I's work and kind of responding to this history of sensory separation um, in relationship to a kind of um, abled, disabled binary um, and pushing back against um, the ways in which that sensory separation um, uh, would use disability or a, a disabled perspective inherently as a kind of um, a deficit that needs to be recovered or elevated in order for it to be valuable. So, um, what is the kind of uh, what 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 is the kind of epistemological space in relationship to um, a sensory understanding, and how do we, um, you know, have a conversation or create a, a work or or have a show or what have you in that space um, without needing to kind of recover it or or move it um, uh, or hold it in relationship to, to an able-bodied perspective. Um, so I think that's, it, it, it's, it's an important uh, distinction to make or, or to, to um, you know, critically engage how we value legibility versus illegibility. Um, but I also maybe be a little bit hesitant to, um, you know, uh, you know, place one maybe is more valuable over the other, where the the kind of entangling of legibility and illegibility um, is is maybe truer or more resonant to me um, in relationship to to disability or or what um, you know a kind of epistemological approach to um, practice might be. So that was um, a really incredible answer. I think that that actually works through a lot of the the questions we've actually both questions we've we've already asked. Um, but I I don't know if Liza, you want to build off of any of that, or um, Rotem, if you want to offer some thoughts. Rotem, I want to let you go since. I feel like Christopher spoke for both of us in a lot of ways, but yeah. 
Okay, thank you, Liza. Um, um, I thinking about a couple of things in relation to this question, I guess. Um, one is that um, I thinking a lot about the experience of uh, of my viewer. I care very much about the experience uh, of my viewer, and um, and I'm and, and the way I look at uh, at this kind of like um, relationship between uh, my artwork and my viewer is that it's a uh, hopefully a meaningful encounter between the two. Um, and, um, and in this, uh, in, in order to create this kind of meaningful uh, encounter, I, I, um, I care very much about uh, all the aspects in the work, but, uh, but, but of course, like the, the thing that I want to point out is, uh, I do thinking about the senses and how material, for example, um, resonate in our body, right? Like type of wood, for example, with, will resonate differently with our body. I right now working with a specific color palette, but they all natural dye because, and I know where they coming from and who uh, cut the flower and everything, right? Because for me, all of this is eventually whether we know it consciously or not going to affect our experience. Um, and I'm very much interested in, in uh, um, making an artwork that uh, um, my view, the viewer hopefully want to be engaged with, but I, I, I don't want to control, uh, I don't want to control what they, uh, I don't think we can anyway, but, but I am, um, uh, I guess I'm interested in, in just the, the, the ability of art to lift our imagination and tell us stories, you know, and each one of us have different stories. Uh, and for me, the, the life of the work exists uh, in between all those stories. So if, if I'm talking about the, the work that at the Wiseman right now, you know, I, you, I don't think you have to blow into the piece in order to experience the piece. Yeah. I'm not also think that you have to look at the piece uh, in order to experience the piece. Like one of the things that was interested in that, like my son was walking uh, somewhere else and like in the show. And then all of a sudden he heard like a very, very low tone. And I'm like, oh, you see, that's my piece, you know? So it's like, um, and and I also, and if you are interested or it's make you question what you're looking at, you can, you know, that there is also all this uh, conversation that we are doing here, uh, writing and life, like different life to this work. Um, So, so when I'm thinking about uh, when I'm thinking about uh, um, about this subject of legibility and illegibility, I'm thinking about uh, don't want to control uh, and don't want to control and not be able to control the parameters uh, of the experience. Um that's that's one thing that that's that's one thing that I would I would want to say. And and then yes, of course I'm I'm hiding, like I think every artist uh we're hiding some uh, jokes or some personal things, you know, inside of the I have a, a lot of like hiding things in my in my work. Uh, and in this work too, you know, but uh, some audience depend where you are, will understand them and some not. And I don't necessarily think that, uh, that it's taking away from experience the work. Um, I just wanted to, so it's, it's seven o'clock and I just wanted to 
include the audience, our audience, if, if they have any questions um, to, um, I think, put them in the Q&A or in the chat. Um, but maybe while folks are thinking about questions or, or writing them up, Rotem, I'm, I'm interested in the concealment of the sound making apparatus and how um what am i trying to ask like the way in which your body understands the piece or or an audience's body understands the piece and and them not being able to kind of like they know there's a sound there, but they cannot see the sound or the apparatus itself. Um, and I think in one of your interviews, you had kind of talked about almost feeling like a magician or sort of like this creative act of, it's almost like pulling a rabbit out of a hat. And so, I mean, <laughs> at which it may, you know, I, I guess I'm wondering if, if maybe, there's also something about magic maybe at play here in that juxtaposition between um, what's available to see and what's kind of behind the the curtain. Um, right, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I like magic tricks. <laughs> so it's just like, I love that. Uh, and I love, you know, uh, I just love the whole kind of uh, 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 stage magics, but um, but yes, like there is um, there is this, uh, and that's the reason also when it's it's related to not be able to separate the the senses, right? Because of course I'm working with uh, the the visual too. On purpose, uh, I want a person to look at this work and wonder what the hell am I looking at? Like when originally when I did it, it was a solo exhibition and it's all was just like something that just looked like raw doors, you know, waiting to be painted. And really the reaction that I want is like, what is it? Like, where is the artwork? Yeah, because that serves something for me, right? This kind of like, I don't know anymore what am I looking at uh, is, uh, serve attention it's it's kind of like it's it's a shift your comfort zone like from comfort zone you all of a sudden into a place of wonder right and this is a trick that a magician use all the time yeah you think that you see what you think that you know everything that's going on but here we go you don't know yeah something happened that it's completely out of the ordinary yeah here it's also in a, an art gallery, I mean, I don't see any color. I don't see any, you know, and um, and I want to put my 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 viewer in a position of um, questioning, uh, questioning, and uh, um, and get out of our uh, get out of our comfort comfort zone in order to open up, in order to look at the reality differently. Uh, in order to doubt what we think we know. Um, yes. Yeah, that, that's, I really like, I, I really like that answer of, of kind of pulling people out of what they think they know and then doing it through, um, in some ways, like, like magic, um, something that's really enjoyable and um, like, joyfully surprising. Um, but I think there is a question in the chat um, from Diane Mullen and Diane writes, might we think of replacing what we generally and almost automatically call the viewer in discussions of art with the term participant? I wonder what the artists here think of that um, experimental proposal. Okay, if I start at least. Um, yeah, this is Liza speaking. Um, I've 
taken to following um, Jenny Brady, who is a Irish filmmaker. Um, she uses the term receiver, um, but I've I, I realized that I've been using experiencer for a number of years, but I, I really love Jenny Brady's term receiver because um, it places a, um, a burden on the, the audience, right? The, the person walking through the, the gallery, the individual um, to receive the artwork. It makes them also responsible for the work. And I really, um, I really love this term and, and actively use it and think everybody should. <laughs> I am also going to be using that term now. That's it's really wonderful. Yeah. Uh, Rotem, did you want to chime in on that? I mean, English, it's not my first language. So for me, there is this uh, cultural barrier. Um, you know, uh, I many times I, uh, I feel that um, maybe I'm not fully aware to, or the way I, uh, the way I interpret receiver or the way I interpret viewer uh, is have different cultural background. Uh, since English, it's not my first language. Uh, so, uh, it's hard for me to say, um, but I, I do absolutely agree, and I hope it was clear from my answers that uh, I I do think that it's a relationship and and uh, the viewer, the participant, the receiver, uh, however we will uh, call uh, the body and come, that come to be engaged, um, uh, have also like it's it's kind of like you know there is the artist there is the the object or the thing uh, there is the space there is uh, the body and we all have it's um, um, it's a relationship uh, that each one of us have a responsibility to be engaged um, and I definitely uh, I think this is a this is crucial for a success of uh, of really having a meaningful experience, probably in life generally, like probably not only in art, but uh, you know. Yeah, and and that that makes a lot of sense um, as well. And um, I think we've got let's see a question from Rob McLean who asks. Liza, how does the scent or taste affect other senses? Do you think experiencing your pieces wakes up more than one type of set of sense simultaneously besides the ones you are hoping the viewer um, hoping the viewer to serve as the sensation? Perhaps immersing the viewer even deeper or further into the engagement. Yeah, it's, um, thanks for the question. Um, I think that that probably happens whenever we slow down, right? Um, like Rotem, I can imagine um, feeling and, and hearing your pieces, like, and those things being really mixed up, right? Um, and in part because the artwork is like offering us an experience for that to happen. Um, and I would hope that the, the scent and um, taste survey would act in a similar way as like a vehicle to become aware, <laughs> to become aware of um, something that we're often not paying that much attention to. Um, and then also to become aware of it through this challenge of translating it into words. Um, which I think often in the past when I've shared this work, I've, um, and I think this also comes up in like audio descriptive captioning um, uh, services and um, accessibility um, where people describe colors as taste or 
um, they sort of like substitute something for another, like the like. Um, I can't think of a good example right now because it's late and I'm just not going to think of a good one, but, um, you know, caramel colored, for example, might be a bad example. I'm sorry, I'm having bad examples at this time of the night, but um, where I think we're inclined to um, mix those things up, especially when we're challenged with the description, the descriptive um, ascribing right of those senses um, because when it, I, I really think that we it's impossible to fully describe the sensory experience through language and um, it has its own language um, and so I like that your question makes me think that maybe this is happening for other people and that's totally cool with me <laughs> yeah oh, that's great um... I think we've got about 20 minutes left. And so I'm wondering if Liza or Tim, if there's something that you all have been talking about that you'd like to talk to each other about, or if um, we have another kind of question about the glitch um, that we could also talk about. So I wanted to offer a, um, I guess a choose your own adventure option here for what, um, what y'all would like to do with the last. 20 minutes. I, I can I can start because um, uh, the way I think it's first of all it's it's interesting that you say glitch and a lot of the work that I saw uh, of Liza for me it's uh, a lot about uh, this kind of glitch and it's about like the Liza, correct me. I'm just saying my uh, in like one of the uh, one of your work that I saw that I really liked was that um, there is it's a video and um, and there is a, a cartoon or something. It's a cartoon, and then you we are not hearing the cartoon or something, but Liza just saying what she think the cartoon saying, and it was hilarious. And it's exactly the experience that I have as a, a hard of hearing person, right? So the minute I cannot hear, I'm using the other senses, right? So it's just it's just a natural thing that you do, and <laughs> but then, but then sometimes when you talk with the person who can hear later on, it's a common thing that they saying like something like, "Where did we saw the same thing? Like, did we, you know?" Did we experience the same thing right now? And um, you know, and it's it's make me wonder, you know, about a different way of uh, the power. Actually, the powerful thing that we it can be a powerful thing to to accept that we're looking at the world at the world differently and embrace that. Uh, of course, I don't I don't feel that we are doing it currently. You know. But uh, but you know it's it's uh, I'm actually not sure what is my do I need to have a question I don't know but uh, I was just you know I was thinking about uh, even like with the work that uh, Liza and Christopher you did um, I'm thinking a lot about this kind of like hearing and not hearing hearing some words and not hearing some words right and then how how that visually look like and how it that's interpreted yeah um um yeah yeah that's thank you so much for checking out some of my other i think you're speaking about um one of my caption works is, um um and i think i like your like uh zoning in on the relationship between um was heard and not heard or what I'm experiencing and what the like primary document is actually doing, right? Like there's, there is a glitch. Um, and I think it's a generative glitch. I hope it is, right? But it's also making me think about um, like that question about legibility or illegibility. And, um, you know, while you were talking, Rotem, um, 
I was thinking about those legibility, illegibility, that binary and its relationship to power or, um, you know, in, in the case of your artworks, like there is something powerful about the apparatus that makes the sound being hidden, right? It makes us, and then it makes me think about things that are illegible as um, the power that they have both to compel us to like look closer, pay more, pay closer attention, right? Or to shift um, our focus on them um, in some way. But it also makes me think about the power of withholding, right? Like um, as an artist working with institutions or as a disabled per person employed by an institution, exhibiting artwork in an in institution, like what does it mean to um, be illegible or to use illegibility as material, right? Um, and what does that mean in terms of like my, my own personal power, or the power of the work or the power of my relationship um, between myself and an institution who is so much bigger and more powerful than myself in a lot of ways. Um, so yeah, I guess I also don't have a question, but was just like kind of like connecting those threads between um, like different spaces, like a, a marginal space and a primary document space and legibility, illegibility. Um, and then what I, you know, I would really hope I get to experience one of your your works in person someday, but what I imagine that experience to be like, where it's like a moment to um, feel what I can't see, and it I can imagine it functioning in such a powerful way that way, if that makes sense. It's interesting for me that you mentioned power. Uh, uh, I don't know if you said power dynamic, but I I will go with the power dynamic and. Uh, and um, who who have the power when and so on, uh, because uh, this work when I first presented it was a specific for a specific gallery in Tel Aviv, that is a very seminal gallery for specific uh, movement that call uh, want of matter, which was. Uh, mainly male dominant like many other movements you know in the 60s and 70s and uh and they were like they um they show their like seminal work and you could recognize their work by their bare like bare plywood so the bare plywood uh if if an artist from israel when an artist from israel came they immediately did this connection and for me, like I, I kind of like in many of my work is like that. It's like I, 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 I did want to kind of like uh, give respect and kind of like homage and reference uh, with respect those those people that actually many of them was my professor in my BFA, but at the same time put my take on it, right? Like bring my identity to it. Uh, yeah. So it's it's it's. Uh, it can look like without the sound, it really can look like a formalist work. Uh, and if I will show you picture of, of work that was in the past, in the 70s, it really looks similar, yeah? But actually creating those empty vases that, that, uh, that creating those sound, you know, I, I, I thought about my own body and uh, kind of like wanted to put myself um and 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 give myself this kind of like um yeah i can be here too yeah now now it's also my my space i have a permission to be here too so um i i think that that background for that work is so interesting especially the choice of using the the tuba, um, which is like the big, it's also that like, I think if we're gonna gender instruments, it's a very masculine instrument. And so to me, there's like now this other layer of thinking about your kind of 
resistance and pushing back against that um that like that masculine movement that that makes sense to me now um and um i think there is a it's kind of i think it's a comment um in the chat here um from michelle linder who writes um not really a question but wanted to share that when i looked at the piece with the man blowing, breathing into the instrument mouthpiece, I immediately heard a trumpet. I have a very good memory of sound, though I am now profoundly hard of hearing. And that magic happens a lot when not all of the information is available visually, as vision is how I take in information. I found myself imagining different instruments and then thought, Maybe there is nothing behind the plywood. It's just a mouthpiece meant to force my imagination. Uh, and then Michelle says, I can't wait to see this at the Weissman. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's that's thank you so much. And um, and for me, it's a. Uh... Again, I, I cannot uh, I, I, I can hear it, but I can hear it the way I hear it, yeah. Um, um as as Liza mentioned, like it's it's we hear differently, like it's uh and um um yeah and, and for me it's uh so 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 it's interesting because um sorry I forgot your name. Uh Michelle said I um Michelle, you said uh, I'm sorry that I cannot see you, it's weird that I cannot see the people, but uh I am um, you said that maybe it's just a plywood and a tuba piece uh, that give me to imagine. And, and this is an, an important, it's something important that I want to pose on it because when we talked about, um, I, I don't know, did we, did, did we talk about trust? Like, did we, tra we, tra we talked about engagement, right? Like it, being engaged with the work, right? And we, uh, we want the we expect the viewer to be engaged with the work. So I I feel that I have um I need to build that trust with uh I I will now use a Liza, a Liza word and I will say with the receiver, with the receiver, yeah. Uh, because so I need to build that trust, and in order to build that trust, it's have to work the in my in my in my mind it will not it will not leave michelle imagination if it will not be real does that make sense i don't know if it makes sense but it's like for me it's like a, again it's like the 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 question about like the material i use and the object the whole object as as a you know sorry to say it like the aura of of each object that exists in the world you know uh i can color something in red that will be spray from Home Depot that cost me $10. And I can go and uh, go and climb a mountain that only a specific flower grow there, right? And I will uh, and I will water it and take care of it. And then I will take it and then I will uh, 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 um, make a powder out of it. And then I will, you know, and all that to make the red. I think we will feel the difference. Even if we will not know anything, we will feel the difference. So for me, um, for me, it's it's crucial that it's actually a maze. It's actually can work. And, and by the way, like I'm not a instrument builder, but actually after making that piece, it's actually can play pretty well. Like it's actually pretty well instrument. And and in in the exhibition that I did in Tel Aviv, I brought a musician to uh, improvise on it, uh, so people can hear also this option. So it's it's a uh, yeah. I would say no more. No, that, that's that's great. I love that that you brought in a musician um, to to work. I mean, interact with that with that piece. Um, I am just wondering if we've got 
just a few minutes left. If, if y'all have any kind of closing thoughts or, or questions um, you want to share or something we didn't get to that you'd like to talk about. I just want to say, well, hi, Michelle. It's nice to see your great question pop up in there. But also, I love what Michelle said about um, having a memory of sound and how that informs imagining. And as someone with hearing loss, deafness, it's like those things are so mixed up for me, like what I remember and what I'm currently hearing and what I'm hearing through my computer ear is all like mixed up together and I just um I think that I just love that oversight and just wanted to to say that I think it's a really beautiful kind of like powerful experience to have actually okay well I think if um Rotem uh, we don't have any more um, offerings. And I'm just so grateful to have been here today and and um, asking questions that um, I think we could go back to um, extensively. I, I almost feel like maybe, um, and Rick, like thinking back on this, I could have just asked one question and we could have just talked about it that way. But um, I'm so grateful for, for you all um, thinking with me and, and thinking together. And so I wanted to say thank you. And I think, um, yeah, someone from the Weissman might have some closing yeah. thoughts. Awesome. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And thank you so much to our wonderful panelists and our moderator um, for this beautiful conversation. Um, you all, everyone who attended are going to be sent a survey after this event, and we'd really appreciate if you fill it out, because it'll really help us with designing our programs um, and support us with our initiatives to better meet everyone's interests and needs. So please fill that out if you can. And then um, that's it. So again, thank you so much for joining us, and I hope that you have an amazing night. Thank you all. Thank you.